So this talk here, it's on the gold track, which means it, it's going to have a little bit more of an architectural kind of flavor to it. But uh, I remember when I was going through and talking about the different uh, proposals with Eric, because he helped me pick out the, the program. How, how's the program been so far? Good? Um, this talk was one of those ones where Eric started saying, well, you know, okay, well, it's a little bit gold, but it also, you know, it's a bit of a case study, and then there's some stuff about DDD that's kind of more basic essential stuff in here. So this one's a little bit of a mix of a story of uh, a system, uh, a refactoring that we did within a, um, a system that's been around for a long time, and uh, also talking about, I mentioned in the abstract, uh, I wanted to spice up the abstract a little bit. Uh, it felt a little plain to me. So I uh, started Googling chemistry terms and was thinking about the idea of reagents and reactants, right? And how when you take these things that on their own uh, are just in a stable state and you combine the, them together in the right conditions, you end up with a chemical reaction, right? That's greater than just the sum of, of the reactants, and especially when you add in solvents and catalysts and things like that. So I guess technically, so for anyone that knows a lot more about chemistry than me in the room, you're probably going to say, well, technically, he's actually talking about catalysts rather than reagents, but just roll with me, okay? <laughs> catalyst is a little bit overused, and reagent starts with the same letter as refactoring, so that's why I did it, right? So I'm going to talk about three different types, or not types of refactoring, but basically refactoring at three different levels. I don't know if you've thought about it this way before, but the idea, you've got uh, Martin Fowler's book, and there's, this book has been translated to a number of other programming languages. I've got the Ruby edition, for example, that really talks about micro-refactorings, things like inline variable, uh, create variable, extract method, extract class, all these types of refactorings that are just the bread and butter of micro design, right? So if you're doing TDD, then you, you're writing a test and you're getting the code to work, and then you're doing these kinds of micro refactorings on your code all the time. You're doing design all the time, right? And that's at that very low level of, of refactoring. And then you've got Joshua Karievsky's wonderful book, Refactoring to Patterns, where he talks about higher level patterns uh, like strategy pattern and a number of others that uh, he talks about, here are, here are smells that you see in the code. Here are things in the code that are indicative of the need to introduce some kind of pattern. Uh, for example, shotgun surgery is one of the pattern, one of the smells he talks about. I change something here, I have to change a whole bunch of other things as well, right? Shotgun surgery. And so then if you find that, does, that smell in your code, here are some patterns that can help you get yourself out of that kind of situation. And when I read Joshua's book, it was, it was a real epiphany for me because I realized that I didn't have to get the design right, right from the start. I, and, and I didn't have to worry quite so much about painting myself into a corner either. I could learn to recognize the smells and then have my tool belt of different refactorings that I could then apply at the right time, right? And practice those refactorings so they became second nature, right? So, I'd encourage you all, at least at the micro refactorings level, if you're not even there yet, if you are coding on a daily basis all the time, you should have, I would strongly recommend, have keyboard memory for every single one of those so that you don't have to think about them. Right? Do you know the keyboard shortcut for extract method in IntelliJ if that's what you're using or in ReSharper? Right? You shouldn't have to even think about that to be able to do it. You shouldn't have to reach for the mouse, it slows you down. Right? So being able to learn those until they become muscle memory so that you can do them fast and, and just make them part of your daily work. If you invest a bit of time in that, like I did a few years ago, it pays dividends, right? Uh, and then the one that I'm going to be talking about more, obviously, because this is Explore DDD, <laughs> is refactoring to a deeper model. And I guess the thing that I found when I first read Eric's book, probably around 2007, 2008, was that um, the, first chapter, the first section on um, ubiquitous language and modeling, collaborative modeling, collaborative design, I was like, wow, this is really great. And then I started kind of getting bogged down in the section on value objects and aggregates and, and started running out of steam a little bit as I was reading through that. Um, but I, I kept going 
and I hit part three where he has this whole section, he tells this story of this project that he was on where the model just wasn't working and they came up with a way of refactoring the model, introducing new concepts into the model and it completely transformed the project. And, and that just really caught my attention. I was like, this, like I actually, so here's a confession, I don't actually enjoy writing code but I love refactoring code, right? I don't enjoy trying to figure out the new thing that I'm trying to do, but I, I love coming in and looking at the code and being able to say, oh, I can make this a little better. So maybe I'm more of an editor than an author, I don't know, but that's what I seem to spend a lot more time, my time doing, is refactoring rather than editing, okay? I remember years ago, the, the company where I was first uh, encountered DDD uh, I was responsible for interviewing, hiring developers, and um, the company didn't really have any kind of assessment for developers. So what I did was I, I just wrote a number of classes and copy-pasted a whole bunch of stuff until the code was really messy. And then basically the, 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 the pre-interview uh, exercise was, uh, here's a class diagram, here's unit tests that pass, Here's this really messy code. You've got an hour. Clean, up it, clean it up as much as you can. And it was incredible to me how much of an insight I got into the way people think about refactoring and code by going, watching them, watching the results of that exercise, right, in terms of what they thought was important in the code and, and whether or not they could actually clean up code and, and make it readable and understand the intent. And the only rule I had in that exercise was the tests need to pass when you're done, right? So I knew which candidates to eliminate right away because they didn't even read the instructions, right? It's like I got several back where the tests were just completely busted, right? Anyway, I digress. Um, so there's these three different levels here, and the refactoring to a deeper model or refactoring to deeper insight is really about the idea that if you can introduce new concepts into your model, that's a far more powerful refactoring than just these micro changes that you're making. But what I would contend is that you need to really get good at micro refactorings and refactoring to patterns to be able to leverage refactoring to a deeper model. And I'm gonna tell a story about that. So I'm gonna be talking about um, this application, uh, Nexia Home Automation. And I actually worked on, this is something that I did with uh, Dan Sharp, who spoke earlier and happens to be in the audience here today. So. Uh, Dan continues to work on the next year application and they are hiring from what I understand. Um, it's a Ruby application and basically it allows you to do all these cool things with devices in your home, right? So uh, be able to know if windows are open, uh, it has video camera support which is primarily what I'll be talking about in this talk. So if you think about this domain for a while, it's not your typical kind of domain. It's not financials, it's not um, insurance or that type of thing. Um, this is hardware, this is firmware, this is the type of situation where who is, who is the domain expert in this situation? It's not like you can go to your customer and say, tell me how this stuff works, right? You have to go to the, um, the people writing the firmware and ask them about it, right? Um, so it's a very highly technical domain. Our goal was to um, continue to work on new features for the application uh, for next year home, but at the same time we noticed that the video camera support was quite poor, uh, to the point where um, it was taking a long time, a new camera would come on the market and we'd be responsible for integrating it into next year home and, and that could take weeks. Right? It was a very complicated involved process with a lot of shotgun surgery. And so our goal was to try and get that from weeks or months down to a much shorter time period. So I'm going to give you a demo of enrolling a new camera into Nexia. So this is the Nexia application, and you can see that we select video. Um, this was a, a demo that Dan and I uh, pre-recorded. And so we choose the device. And so you might be noticing already there's some uh, language that's specific to this application. So you don't add a device to Nexia. It's that you enroll a device with Nexia, right? This is actually the device enrollment process. And then you activate a camera, okay? This language may become important later in the talk, OK? 
Okay, so you can see that it's set up, and we'll name it Dan's new cam. And then just like magic, there it is. And we got live video of me and Dan. There we go. All right, you're supposed to, that, that's cool, right? That's a cool thing. So let's do a little bit of an architectural walkthrough of this, of this process. Actually, hold on a sec. This is the, uh, so this is not enrolling a camera. This is now connecting a camera that has already been enrolled in Nexia. So enrollment is basically letting Nexia know this camera exists, then it can actually talk to Nexia. And then now we're just going to connect it to Nexia. So we'll walk through that process. So you can imagine a uh, customer has a video camera in their house. And uh, from, the, but, but from the perspective of our application, it's not just one camera. There's many, many cameras, right? Thousands of cameras that are functioning as little independent web servers that are talking over HTTP, SSL to these camera manager components. And there's not just one camera manager. There's many, right, that are being hosted there. These uh, camera managers are written in Java. And as messages come in from the camera, we have to get them to the actual system itself. So we enqueue the messages from the camera onto a job queue. And then those jobs are then pulled off by what we call the portal. And part of the portal is the portal workers, which are written in Ruby. Okay, so these are. Um, running in the background, there's many of them. And then those portal workers and the, the, the next year application needs to talk back to the cameras. So we have a message bus. And so we basically queue up messages on the message bus to go back to the camera manager to be able to send commands to the cameras, right? So this is kind of the high, extremely high level picture of what it's like to activate a camera with Nexia. Now, in terms of the application itself, it's a Rails application. So I'm just highlighting some of the things here. If you're familiar with Rails, we have controllers. There's the cameras controller. Uh, next year allows you to set up automations where you can say something like, uh, at sunset, do certain things in your home, right? Um, or at a certain time of night, dim the lights, turn off the lights, cool stuff like that. Um, We've got things there like uh, camera video, uh, camera operation. We, you can see there under models. So the way it works in Rails, if you're not familiar with that, is it has a folder that's called models. And that's basically where you store, well, the typical Rails projects, that's where you store pretty much everything. right? Um, everything that doesn't fit in your controllers goes in models. right? So I don't want you to think of this as your typical kind of rich domain model you know, that's not what you're going to see, at least not to start with. And then we've got a camera activation class. And then further down are the workers that I'm talking about. So there were three main challenges that I just want to hit fairly quickly. Number one, the code was very difficult to reason about. It was very hard to understand in this kind of situation what was going on here. So to start with, the camera manager on the Java side was a little bit over-architected by the time we got to it. Right? It was designed to be a meta framework for any type of camera that could ever possibly connect in. But what had happened in reality with the system is that there were, most of the cameras were you know, SSL, HTTP. They were all quite similar in terms of the types of things that were being abstracted away in this framework. So there was a lot of complexity in there. There were lots of abstraction layers that we really didn't need, right? but we had to deal with every day when we were working in that code. So it's that familiar thing, right, of you, you inherit code that, for whatever reason, accidents of history is more than it needs to be, and it has some warts, and that's the situation we had. So here's an example on the Java side. This is a method that handles requests that originate from the camera. So this is the Java side, the left side of that diagram. And let's just highlight a few things here. So firstly, from the perspective, this is a DDD conference, so from the perspective of ubiquitous language, my spider sense goes off on line 91 right away. I'm like, what on earth is that? Right? What does that mean? Uh, do we have some kind of apocalypse I need to be preparing for here? What is going on there? And then secondly, 
what's going on with this. If you look at the uh, if is not authorized, okay, so we're talking about authorization. Great, I know what that is. And then let's try the next, well, wait a minute, what's the comment say? We're not currently authenticated? So let's try to authenticate. Well, what are we doing? Are we authorizing or are we authenticating? Okay, they are not the same thing, right? Um, is it about trying to keep them out or is it tr trying to, that they're in, but we're trying to stop them from accessing certain things, right? Oh, but even better, we've got this auth, which because both words start with the same four letters, it can double for either one. And then we're getting header authorization. So maybe it really is authorization, but I'm still not sure because that comment has me worried. Okay, so that's some of the Java side that we were dealing with. So not a big issue, but what I want you to understand is I'm just showing you a tiny bit that's indicative of everything else that we were dealing with, and that, that'll be the case through this whole talk. So on the Ruby side, what we had with these portal workers was that the camera support in Rails had um, evolved over time, and like a lot of teams, we've had, con had contractors come through um, who did the best that they could, but weren't always paying attention to the model itself, and there were a lot of responsibilities. So here's an example. This is the camera worker that is responsible for authenticating and closing camera connections. So this is on the Ruby side. Now, the great thing about Ruby code is that it's so concise, and you can express a lot of things in a very small number of lines, unless you're in this method because there's blocks of code commented out here that uh, might have been important at some point, and the method just keeps going. And then uh, you'll notice there that this method is actually reaching inside this camera model object. Notice that? It's doing surgery on the internals of the camera. So rather than telling the camera something, it's going in, so this is a worker. Right, it's going inside the camera object and doing stuff, just like a surgeon saying, you know, something falls out of the body, they're like, pick that up, that might be important later, right? <laughs> we've got here, we've got camera model, we're setting the firmware version, we're, we're setting set connected true, that type of thing. Um, it looks like we are telling the camera to actually do something. This looks like a command to start motion, but it's not, right? We learned, right? Um, or maybe it is, who knows, right? Uh, the, the method still goes on. So uh, we have, if it's an authorized house, now we're actually doing more with the camera, but this seems a little bit different because it looks more like we're actually setting up a completely new camera, right? We're building this camera object and now we're actually specifying its attributes right inside this worker method, which continues to go on, right? So 136 lines of Ruby code to do all this kind of stuff. It's not something I could even fit on a single slide, right? So this is on the Ruby side of things. So that was the first thing. Code's hard to reason about. Second thing, camera manager is overly coupled to the device manager. So what do I mean by that? Well, the camera manager actually uh, evolved out of a more general device manager component. And the device manager was set up to work with different types of, a variety of different types of devices. And so I guess the thought was originally, well, a camera is a device, a device is a device, so let's just use the same thing. And so what we ended up with, to talk about a DDD pattern, is we ended up with a shared kernel with the rest of Nexia around this device manager. And we had this issue where the version of Java on the device manager was old and we couldn't do anything to the camera one because we were tied to that version of Java because we had this coupling between these two. And what we found is that that coupling was actually unnecessary, right? A camera is a device, but it's nothing like a lock, right? Um, unless you have a lock that has a camera built in and then it is like a lock, but... The third one, which is more of a DDD kind of perspective, is where was the domain knowledge? Uh, it actually was mostly here. So if we had to add a new feature, because a lot of the domain knowledge was inside the, the camera manager, it was complex, time-consuming, error-prone, uh, hard to test, and like I said, a lot of shotgun surgery around that side of things. So let's look at the Java side. So here's an example of 
start that start motion method. All right. So on the Java side of things. And so you can see in here we've got a lot of stuff that seems to be setting up some kind of camera message. It's, um, it's defining, oh my goodness, there's regular expressions down, down the bottom there in terms of patterns. And then it's, it's doing something with parameters here. Oh, but that's not the end of the method. It keeps going. But then we've got it hard-coded that if it's this certain camera model, then do something different. Um, and it keeps, keeps going. And Oh, and look at this. We've got this whole, let me go back a sec. We've got this whole event entry thing, which has got all these different parameters, all these magic numbers that I couldn't even fit on the slide. What does that all mean? All right. So that's on the Java side. On the Ruby side, uh, start motion, the equivalent kind of thing there. Um, so we've got this type of thing. Is it outdoor? Then we set up all these command options. Um, apparently, somebody at some point had decided that they should put test code in production. So there's a local URL there for uh, the HTTP URL. And then we've got things like event trigger one. What does that mean? Uh, PIR mode one. Self.quality plus two. Two must be really important, right? Three's bad. Four's right out of the question. <laughs> and then we've got more, right? So who knows what any of this means? OK, so what I'm trying to do is just give you a sense. I don't want you to think, well, he's just coming up here and complaining about code. We do that every day, big deal, right? Um, but what I'm trying to, to do is give you an indication of, well, here are the kind of challenges we had. But these are not insurmountable challenges, right? So from a DDD perspective, number one, I'll just go through this quickly. We want to grow and express a deep domain model in the code. Number two, we want to refactor the code towards ubiquitous language, towards a common language where things are consistent and well understood, so the intent is clear in the code. And then number three, we want to make sure that we have good boundaries, like Eric talked about last night. Boundaries matter, right? It's very hard to have uh, cohesion, high cohesion and low coupling without good boundaries. You want to have that good cohesion in your objects and be loosely coupled with other things. And the other one is being clear about model boundaries and then knowing when to translate, where those model boundaries are and translating explicitly across those. So here's the challenge. What do you do when you face code like this? Right? Do you, I mean, one option is to rage quit. <laughs> I'm done. Right? Or I'm busy. And those may be valid options. Um, you know, what I see a lot of people doing is, well, let's just fix it all. Right? Let's just start again. Let's start from scratch. I'm, I'm tired. I just want to get it done. But I don't think that that works very well most of the time, right? Because you've, you're still on the hook to get features out the door. You're still on the hook to be delivering functionality. So while I've seen people say things like, I'm taking the sprint off. Don't bother me. I'm going to go refactor this stuff, and it can work. Um, that's not the approach that I think is, is always the best one. Um, option number two. I don't know if you've read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I highly recommend it. But basically, the idea is, how do you make something invisible? And in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, they say, well, you can't. Invisibility is impossible. It's just not possible in the, in the universe we live in. But you can effectively make something invisible by surrounding it in an SEP field. Somebody else's problem. So long as you can say, well, that's somebody else's problem, it's effectively invisible. So you can kind of go that option with the code as well. It's like, well, it's somebody else's problem. And you know, we've all done that from time to time. What I'd like to recommend is experiment, right? See what you can do. So uh, there's a story from uh, recently from the London Olympics of this idea of the London Olympic team, um, the cycling team. They decided to experiment with this approach of let's find every like find the things that are like small improvements and make many, many, many of them over a period of time, like small experiments. And you know, this is not an unfamiliar idea from Agile, the idea of continuous improvement. But I love his phrase, the aggregation of marginal gains. None of these gains on their own are significant at all, right? But the, 
the cumulative effect of marginal gains is incredible. So I've already seen it, you know, speaking as a conference organizer, the people that are contributing to the real-time retro is awesome because that is exactly an example of marginal gains where little improvements along the way that can be made by the conference organizers make the experience better for everyone and they are cumulative, not incremental. So he says, forget about perfection, focus on progression and compound the improvements. And that's really what I want to suggest we do. We tried a bunch of different, different things. A lot of it didn't work. But on March 2014, we took a baby step. What we said was, OK, so on the, um, we, we seem to see that the, the concept of a camera is actually two different responsibilities, right? We want single responsibility on our things. So one is a camera is a stateful representation of a physical device. So it's an entity, right? It's something that's out there that um, is different from another camera. But then the other thing we noticed is that a camera actually does things. It's an interface to sending commands and queries to a physical device. And, and our camera object was trying to do both, right? It was trying to be sort of um, a command handler and an entity at the same time. So we said, well, what could we do about that? We have this camera object on the Ruby side. Both responsibilities are in the camera. Not only that, but it's subclasses device, which brought a whole bunch of baggage with it in terms of the hierarchy. And then because this is uh, Rails, we've got this whole thing of uh, this huge god object for camera. So what did, what did we decide to do? Well, rather than change camera first, we decided to add something new. Right? So that whole thing of being open to extension, closed to modification, you know, that's the idea, right? is that you add new stuff if you can, rather than modify the existing stuff, you know, be biased towards adding new stuff, and, and then refactor the existing stuff once you get the new stuff working, or as you get the new stuff working. So we decided to add a new domain service, command service, to handle the camera behavior. So all the commands and queries now we could send, at least send through this command service as a new thing. The cool thing about this is because of the approach we were taking of making it an extension, you know, an additive change, is we drove it out, TDD, pair program, the whole thing, command by command, going through, adding in this new functionality. And uh, because we had a good test suite, over the controllers and that, we were able to do these kinds of changes without, with, with a fair degree of confidence in terms of what we were doing. So that was the first step. That's a baby step, right? And that was a marginal gain, but it was still a gain. Meanwhile, we're working on other features and we tried some other things. Um, August, so that was, what did I say, March 2014? So almost a year later, we tried something else. Martin Fowler talks about finding a seam in your code, some place where you can insert something new. So uh, we did an event storming session on the, the various ways that devices are enrolled in Nexia, um, comparing those. And you can see that in the different swim lanes. You can see the, actually the common patterns between those different devices there in terms of the, the way the components interact. Uh, here's Dan walking through it with uh, some of the other people from the team. So we decided on the Java side, what could we do? The camera manager has a lot of smarts, way too many. It should, the, so here's the hypothesis. It should just be managing camera sessions and nothing else. Right? It should just be fairly dumb rather than being where most of the domain logic was. And so our thought was, what if we could make camera manager into just a generic HTTP proxy and not much else and you know, basically consolidate the smarts around the camera commands on the Ruby side. So the theme was, why don't we introduce a new generic command on camera manager? And so we created this send URL method. Because you notice, you probably remember back from the code, that it's basically generating, creating URLs and then sending them through to uh, the, it, it has URLs with parameters that it's passing through to the camera. And because the camera is an HTTP server, it responds to those, right? So we said, well, let's just create a generic method that does that. So we started refactoring that way. We added this new method. Actually, it wasn't a refactor. It was adding this new method. So we wanted to focus the model on being a generic connection proxy only. So focus on things like a proxy needs to care about several things. It needs to care about connection management, authentication, the messaging between the camera and the portal, and you know, something that was 
super, super critical is what happens when things go wrong is some kind of logging, right? So that we can actually have metrics around how the cameras are doing. So then on the Ruby side of things using the seam, now we could take this marginal gain from the year before, this command service, and have it generate these commands. And then now we have the ability on the Ruby side to send arbitrary commands to the camera, right? So then we could start migrating domain logic to the, from the Java side of things to the Ruby side of things a piece at a time because now we had the ability to just treat the Java side as a proxy, dumb proxy basically in terms of sending on commands, a dispatcher for the commands. And then on the Ruby side, we can start creating these commands. So we started, uh, in this case, we took the camera command service commands like pan tilt and one at a time, we moved them over on the Ruby side, moved over the URLs and things like that, put them on the, the Ruby side so that we could, and tested them one at a time to make sure that they were actually being passed through. Still not changing the Java code. Right, that's what's cool about this kind of approach. So it was an internal refactor only. The calling code didn't have to change. Okay. So these are small steps, right? But here's the thing. When you're doing this type of work, the question I often get, and Dan and I both got this question after doing previous versions of this talk, is, well, how do you justify these kinds of refactorings, right? Well, Part of it is we were continuing to deliver features in the application, and this was more like something we were doing uh, as we could. But then also being able to provide generic URLs to the cameras allowed some early wins. We were able to bulk upgrade the firmware on all the installed cameras because now we had the ability to send those commands from Ruby. Right? That was cool, right? Not only that, but, and this is something that I don't think we pay enough attention to, is because we had now the ability to experiment with things on the Ruby side. We could have this faster feedback loop in terms of being able to try things out with the cameras, right? Before we had to do all that through Java and Ruby. So the thing I, I really want to emphasize here as you're going through and even just thinking about refactoring as an activity is to look for early wins, right? Um, the people on the business side don't care that you refactor the code. I think generally they assume that you are doing the best possible job you can in writing maintainable code, right? Non-technical stakeholders assume that you are a professional and that you are doing that. So that means that you have to build up trust to be able to do these types of things and early wins are one way of doing that, right? It also allowed us to build up some credibility and momentum to be able to do a cleanup on the Ruby side of things. We noticed with the camera worker that authentication was actually three different kinds of things that were going on, right? So one was, if there's a camera that's already been enrolled that Nexia knows about, we need to enable that camera to reconnect and authenticate it. Secondly, we need to be able to enroll a camera, right? To create and authenticate a camera that Nexia has never heard of before. And then here's the reveal on what a zombie is. A zombie is a camera that has connected to Nexia because they connect automatically, but it's never actually been authenticated. So there's some camera out there, someone's basement, that's plugged in, that's talking to Nexia, but the owner has never actually enrolled it. So what we worked on then was to be able to do those three different types of authentication as separate things. So you can see this one here, We've got if camera, authenticate camera session, else activate camera session, else zombify camera session. Much better than what we had before. And then on the camera side, you can see here, we had this old code, for example, in the camera model on the Ruby side that says needs firmware update, and then a whole bunch of kind of inscrutable code about does it need a firmware update or not. So we started refactoring on the Ruby side and said, well, how could we clean up this question of whether it needs a firmware update or not? And so that's what the method ended up as by the time we were done. Right? Now it reads like English. Is this a model that we know about? And uh, is there a recommended version for this? And is a firmware upgrade not currently in progress? And is the firmware old? Huh, needs a firmware update. Right? 
compare the difference, like a new developer comes on the team and you say, can you fix this versus can you fix this? All right, completely different conversation. Now, another thing we did on the camera model is this is a huge class. Uh, it's, it was huge. And here's the thing that if you come across something like that, here's a tip, is you don't even have to refactor the code to increase your level of clarity. Just get into your text editor and start rearranging it. Start looking for patterns. Start taking methods and moving them around so that methods are near like methods. It's a very simple technique, but it can just getting that cognitive clutter sorted out is huge, right? So that's something to keep in mind as well. So now we have this situation where the camera knows what capabilities it supports. So does it support high definition or low res? Is it indoor, outdoor? We were able to start introducing these smarts into the camera and, and cleaning it up. Remember I showed you that old camera worker class on the Ruby side that had all this here. So what does that look like to you? You know, what pattern is that? That block of code. What's the smell? So it's like a, it's doing internal surgery on the camera. It's, yeah, it's, it's creating a camera. So what, what's the pattern if you have to create something? A factory, right? So exactly. So we introduced um, to a, a factory method. So we had this ubiquitous language of the heartbeat. That's what's coming in. The cameras connect on a regular basis to tell Nexia that they're still alive. And so sometimes some, someone will change, a, the customer will change something on the camera and the next heartbeat will send through an update. So we, we added an upbeat from heartbeat method and then we created a create from heartbeat method. When we get the first heartbeat, the camera is born. It's his first heartbeat. Right. Okay, so that was on the Ruby side. On the Java side, we started doing things like uh, stripping all the commands out and simplifying it down, removing all that domain logic. So, for example, here's the old code. Here's the new code. Old. New. It's like a breath of fresh air, isn't it? I'll do it again. Right. So nice, just by doing some extract methods. So what am I getting at here? So this is the type of thing where you come into some code and it's like an impenetrable fog. You can't see anything. You know, are there trees? Are there mountains? I have no idea, right? But the whole idea is as you start to clear away some of this clutter and rearrange things over time, these marginal gains are cumulative things that actually lead to these deeper insights, right? So these marginal gains of the micro refactorings that Martin Fowler talks about and that Joshua Karievsky talks about, they become these cumulative things that can lead to these deeper insights in terms of new concepts and refactoring to a deeper model, right? Here's an example of something that was Maybe not a hugely deep insight, but something that was opened up for us on the Ruby side. We realized that we were sending commands to the camera, so we said, well, let's follow Joshua's advice and actually introduce the command pattern. Right? So this dramatically simplified things. Set up a base class, class for commands with a standard execute method, and then basically generate the commands. So now we could add a new folder in there called command, and everything that we had to set to the camera was now in there. Related to that, we added in, and this was mostly Dan, I think it was all Dan, the fe a feature toggle, so that basically for these new commands, we could recognize when one of the new commands was coming in versus one of the old ones, so that it would work in production no matter what, right? So I highly recommend using things like feature toggles to be able to refactor safely in this kind of way and support these types of introductions. So you can see here we've got camera, we've got this new authenticate, we've got the command service that we added in. And then the other thing that I want to mention here is we did a phase rollout. So this is an application where there were, um, you know, think uh, many, many cameras, like thousands, tens of thousands of cameras that are simultaneously connected. The last thing you want to do is simultaneously disconnect every single camera. 
why might that be a bad idea? I'll let you figure that out. All right. um, but the team had this phrase, thundering herd, that uh, might conjure up the reasons why. So what we did was we did a phase release where for the, the first month, at the end of the first month, we did, um, we did uh, a very limited release on a single production server. And it, the audience was just internal. So this was like dog fooding this stuff just to make sure it was working correctly for these larger refactorings that we're talking about. And then a little while later when that looked like it was going okay and we, you know, there were a few minor things but we got them sorted out, then um, we upped the firmware and we're still on a single production server but now we're actually talking about certain select customers that we were rolling this out to to see how it went for them. And then finally, early on the third month, we went all cameras and uh, all customers, all servers. And you know, there were a few issues and that's to be expected, but it was actually very, very smooth right? compared to some of the production rollouts I've been involved with in my career that kept me up all night and gave me ulcers. One of the things that a feature toggle is great about, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, the idea of real options, there's a, a great book called Commitment. It's a graphic novel that talks about the concept of real options. But the idea is that if you can defer, you know, you, you'll often go into a meeting and you hear somebody say, well, we need to make a decision on this right now, right? And everyone's like, okay. Uh, even though everyone in the room knows you don't have enough information to make the right decision. Real option says, well, there's a third choice to make a decision or don't make a decision. The third choice is defer the decision until we have enough information to make the right decision. And all we need to do is decide now on how far that deferment might be. Feature toggles, and, and that's a tremendously powerful thing, right? Because if you, I think a lot of good design, a lot of good architecture is knowing which decisions you can defer, right? Because you know, do you really need a database? There's a great talk by Uncle Bob Martin on uh, developing the, the fitness tool where they decided to defer the decision, coded in such a way that they could defer the decision as to whether it was going to need a database, even though everyone told them it would need a database. And they found out they never did, right? It was, they were able to build it on top of a wiki and, and just make it work that way. And it was, uh, it was a beautiful thing. So feature toggles, false, uh, phase rollouts create options. So real options says options have value, right? It says options have value, never destroy an option unless you know why. And so creating more options for yourself is key. So this was uh, a great day where we, uh, Dan actually removed the feature toggle code. You can see there, uh, it's a good day when you can come in and delete a bunch of code, right? That's a good day. It's like, I might just go home now. I feel like I've already accomplished everything I need to accomplish. Uh, it's actually quite a large commit. A lot of specs went away because we didn't need them anymore. Some other options that we had considered at the time is taking, you know, there's a lot of variations on the cameras, so maybe we could introduce some more uh, smarts around that in terms of what you can do with a camera. And then uh, maybe use other things like uh, functionality modules instead of complex conditional logic, right? So actually use inheritance and composition, composition to our advantage. So let me just talk about some of the wins to close up here. So what we found on this project was that, like I said at the beginning, adding a new camera as a supported device took months, weeks. And there were lots of changes on the Ruby side, the Java side, and it was kind of stressful and fraught with problems. And then after we did these series of refactorings, now it was relatively trivial to add a camera, like we could do it in hours. Um, not only that, but the changes were all in one place in the Ruby code, and the code was way more cohesive than what we had wanted. Code was easier to read about, the contexts were clear, and we also removed that dependency, that gnarly dependency between uh, camera manager and device manager in terms of the Java version and that tight coupling that was there. So one of the things here is try some different options. Try naming things different things, right? Don't just, when you think, well, I'm going to call it this or I'm going to call it that, try experimenting with some different ideas before you land on 
the thing that you're going to do. The other thing I would say is embrace in your coding, in your day-to-day -day work, embrace the idea of marginal gains, right? I think that as a species, we dramatically overestimate the power of big changes, uh, you know, infrequent big changes, and dramatically underestimate the power of cumulative small changes, right? Thank you. So I'll throw it open for questions. Got a microphone if anyone has this one down here. Hold on, it's coming. Okay. Um, my biggest frustration as like as I try to improve the code base use refactoring, there are lots of developers working on this application and don't care much about it. And it's while you're improving one part, there are 10 parts that are getting worse. Mm -hmm. How do you handle that? How do you Tell them to stop. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah what, what do you, you know, it's hard to soar like an eagle when you work with turkeys, is it that kind of thing? So. Part of this is, I mean, this was Dan and I working on this one project and uh, telling this story. In terms of, I mean, I, I guess my general advice with things like that is on your team and in as, as much as you have the ability to influence it, is start moving your team towards a culture of wanting to learn and wanting to improve. So um, doing a, things like doing a, a book club, uh, watching videos, um, getting people to start to up their skills. Sometimes, I don't think people do, uh, change code in that kind of way because they're malicious. No. I think yeah. it, it's probably more ignorance or yeah. a lack of skill in certain areas. And so, so if that's the real issue, then that's something we can actually do something about, which is um, start cultivating passion and skill around some of these kinds of areas. So I've worked with a bunch of dev leads, and this really comes back to being you know, a team lead, being an influencer in your organization and, and saying, okay, so we're all going, you know, telling the team, we're all going to read this book, right? We're all going to read Joshua Karievsky's book and we're going to start practicing this on some of the code that we're working on. And we're going to set aside time to do that because it's important. Like, that's the kind of thing I would recommend, which isn't going to work in every situation. Uh, I, I had someone in Brussels a couple of months ago that said, well, what if I'm the only person that cares about writing good code in my company. And you know, it's like I said, well, the, pe the company that is sponsoring this event is hiring. So that's always another option, <laughs> right? Um, because you've got to, you know, at some level, you've got to find a, a job and an environment that's actually going to allow you to thrive as well. OK, so uh, that would be, we can talk about it more afterwards as well. But that's all I've got uh, at this moment. An another question, if somebody else wants to ask. I have one more question on, you said you wrote uh, tests before you started refactoring, high level tests, and you also gave reference to it, working effectively with legacy code base. Right. And, and I've gone through the chapter where he's talking about that. Um, and as I've started refactoring and writing tests, like this, I have to refactor so much to be even able to write tests around some of this code. Like just, <laughs> you can't write tests around this code Right. Like how did you manage to write tests without refactoring first? Well, so we had some tests in place. So it didn't strictly fit Martin Fa uh, Michael Feather's definition of legacy code, which is code without tests, right? So we had some tests in place, and we were able to lean on those quite heavily. But notice the other thing we did was we started trying, like we found a seam, which is what Michael Feathers talks about, like just one place where we could insert, and then we basically drove a wedge in there with the new code that we could test, right? So the new code we were writing was fully tested. And so we just, but we had to like split the wood with the ax to be able to do that in that one area and then that allowed us to do that. Okay. Yeah, good questions, thank you. Yeah, we've got yeah. time for one more. I I did, this is a really quick comment. If you're having trouble with uh, maybe the team you work with, one option is to try pair programming. Yeah, so the other thing I should mention is every, every line of code we, we wrote for this 
except when I was traveling. <laughs> For the time that I was there, it was pair programming. And it was, uh, we did pair programming sitting next to each other. We also did pair programming uh, remotely uh, using, uh, we had iPads set up with Skype so we could see each other and then Screen Hero for actually pairing on the coding, which, you know, it's not quite as great as sitting next to each other, but it was, it still worked really well for us. Thank you, Paul. All right. Thank you.